Welcome to Mind Fitness Warriors. This is an online interview series where we are connecting with people all over the world who have gone through the deepest and darkest valleys of mental health and risen out the other side, here sharing their raw and real experiences and journeys with us and their road to recovery. So today I have joining me Megan Hall. She's coming to us from Virginia in the US and she is a women's empowerment coach. She's also a mom of four, a military spouse and I actually just learned about the very <laughs> cool thing that her husband does in the military and it's fascinating um, and she's also here to help raise awareness on depression and suicide after her own personal journey so I'm going to be inviting Megan here who is going to be sharing her story with us taking us through you know where she started her journey and some of those deep dark moments that she went through and how she was able to come out that other side and really be able to live this gifted life now and and what she's sharing with other people so Megan the floor is yours Yay. I was actually just sharing before we started this that I've dealt with depression my entire life. I, I didn't notice it until later on in, you know, that when I was a child, I would just get to these points where I would feel nothing and I would not want to be around people and I would just want to curl up inside myself. Books were actually my escape for this. So I would take a book out. We lived on 50 acres of land. So lots and lots of nature to go to. And I would escape with a book and just not want to be around anybody. I remember there was just times that it was kind of oppressing to have like this feeling of emptiness. And I never knew why I felt that way. My family wasn't big on mental health. So even though I have a great, great grandfather who um, hung himself, like I didn't know these things until I was older and actually had my own mental health um, struggles that my grandmother was like, oh, well, your great, great grandfather, he hung himself. I'm like, well, that's something you should probably tell us when we're younger and we might understand. My first time ever having a suicidal ideation, I was 13. My parents had divorced and I had moved down to Florida in the United States with my dad. And I just remember being so, just so distraught. Like my parents were married for 13 years. I didn't understand. I was so confused. And they kind of used my sister and I as like their their way to vent about what happened in their marriage. And as a teenager, I should not have known half the things I did. So not only did was I dealing with my own feelings, but I was dealing with all these feelings for my parents as well. And I consider myself an empath. So I kind of absorb people's <laughs> emotions, which makes things way worse. And I remember I just I just wanted it to end. I just wanted all of the the overwhelm to to end it was scary and i i felt like i was part of the reason that my parents had divorced and maybe if i just wasn't around maybe they wouldn't have divorced because there was a lot of issues that had gone on in their marriage and you know with them venting i felt like i must be the reason why right uh luckily i i didn't go through with it and i dealt with suicidal ideation on and off most of my life, I didn't actually hit an all-time low until I was in college. And I didn't know alcohol is a depressant. So if you are depressed and you're drinking a lot of alcohol, it makes you worse. Well, alcohol, when I was in college, became my way of coping with all of this baggage that I hadn't dealt with, you know, things growing up between my parents and you know, sexual abuse that had happened, emotional abuse that had happened. I never dealt with these things. I never had a place to process them. My, like I said, my parents weren't big on mental health, so we didn't seek out therapy. Even when sexual abuse had come out, um, my parents didn't take my sister and I to see a therapist or anything like that. Things that me now as a parent think like, that's just common sense. Like you would just take your, your kids to go see that, you know, see a mental health professional when they've gone through this, but they didn't. So when I was in college, I, I used alcohol as my way of dealing with my feelings because I didn't have to deal with them. It kind of numbed them out. So I, I just, didn't have to feel anything anymore. And not in the way depression makes me feel nothing. Like just like I had this like fun floaty feeling like life is great. Everything's wonderful. And it actually became quite a problem when I was in college. And the worst thing was I'm depressed. I'm taking a depressant with alcohol, which made me even more depressed. And I remember I got to this point 
where I'm like, there's something wrong here. So I went to my primary care physician and I said, I, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm thinking. She's like, oh, here's a pill. Well, no, like you should seek out therapy. None of this. Just here's a pill. It'll make you feel better. The pill actually made me feel worse. I was the one in 1 million people that it increased my suicidal ideation so much that I was actually holding a knife to my throat one night. Like just, I was out of control. And I explain it like, I felt like I was outside my body looking in. Like there's no way that I could be doing this right now. And even at that point in time in my life, I kept thinking like suicide selfish, I could never do that. But then when you're in that place, you just don't know what you are capable of doing. And so I went off that medication. My doctor kind of shamed me. She's like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, I know what I'm feeling and this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't helping me any. So I never went and actually sought out a therapist or anything like that. And I got into a very abusive relationship um, with my second daughter's father. So I was a teen mom. I had my first daughter when I was a teenager, uh, which was a fun journey of growing up with her. But my second daughter, I was with her father and he was very abusive. At first it started out with just comments here and there, and then it ended with him shooting off a gun in my house. So I already had all these things that I needed to work through. Then add this on top of it. Now I'm like, I'm just a hot mess. Like I'm a shell of a person of the girl that I knew growing up. I ended up dropping out of college because I was in this relationship. And anybody who's familiar with an abusive relationship, the abuser slowly strips you of everything that's important to you. And I feel like he started that with college. So what he would do is he would call me and say, I'm struggling really bad. I really need your help. Can you come here and talk to me? And so I would go and it would just be like an hour or two at first. I might miss one class and then it was a day's worth of classes and then it was a week's worth of classes and so on and so forth. Now looking back and knowing about abuse, I, he, there was a plan, right? There was this plan of taking things that were important away from me because once I stopped going to classes, I'm no longer in school. So my first time in college, I, I flunked out my last semester and, and never went back. And I was in this relationship with him where he slowly did that. He stripped away my family. He didn't want to be around them. He had drug and alcohol problems. And when he got sober, and I put that in quotation marks because he did for like maybe six months, he claimed he couldn't be around my family because my mom drank beer. And as a you know recovering alcoholic, that was bad for him and he couldn't be around it. So I was no longer seeing my family. And then all of a sudden I wasn't seeing my friends because my friends are bad people. Like they don't want us to be together. Like how could they not support my relationship with him? You know, and we got engaged and we were planning our wedding. And then he started getting back into the drugs and alcohol. And this should have been my like red flag. This should have been like the third time I left him, but I didn't. And I stayed with it thinking like, once we're married, he'll get sober again. We'll be great. We have a daughter together. And it never happened. And it slowly got worse and worse and worse. In the beginning, it was just verbal abuse. And then it became sexual abuse, which I didn't notice until after I got out of that relationship that that's what was going on. Because you think you're brought up like, if you're in a relationship, they should be able to have sex with you whenever. That's not true. And so now looking back, I'm like, well, I was sexually abused as well when I was with him. And then the final night that we were together, it became physical, where he was actually throwing things at me. And he was choking me and everything like that. And the next day I was like, I'm leaving. I'm not doing this anymore. And he shot off a gun in my house. We don't know if he was planning on killing me or what he was planning on doing with it. But needless to say, that was the end. That was the end. And a couple months later, I actually met my husband now, who is a wonderfully supportive man. I, I don't even know if I'd be where I am today without him because he stuck with me when I was in like the darkest of times. Uh, when we first got together and we were married, I still had that habit of leaning on alcohol to deal with my feelings. So there was plenty of times that I would get super drunk um, and my hate and anger and all the feelings I was feeling would come out at him instead of me actually processing them appropriately. And for the first three years of our marriage, that's, that was the reoccurring theme. Every couple of months, Megan would get really drunk and scream at Jeremy. And then, you know, the next day I'd have to apologize, apologize, apologize and say, I'll never do that again. Well, the final time that it ended, 
uh, it was my right after my husband's 10 year reunion from high school. We went to some friend's house and at the time I didn't realize I have social anxiety. <laughs> so to try to fit in with people, I would use different ways of coping with that. And alcohol was one of those ways. I ended up drinking a whole bottle of vodka to myself, like puked everywhere, was a hot mess. The next morning I woke up and I didn't know what happened. And I was so confused. And my hu husband was so angry, which he had full rights to be angry. And I'm like, I can't keep doing this. Like I, I was depressed. I kept thinking like, I'm ruining his life by being here with him. Like if I wasn't around, if I wasn't part of this equation, he could find a new wife that was, you know, didn't have all this baggage and was such a wonderful person and he could just move on. And then my kids could have a better mom, a mom that wasn't dealing with depression, didn't have all these things going on inside of her head. And they would have a much better life if I wasn't around. So I, w I had all these, like within like two hours of waking up, I had built up this whole picture in my head that life would be better off if I just wasn't here. And then I wouldn't constantly be dealing with these feelings or lack thereof, because sometimes with my depression, I just feel nothing. I, I'm not motivated, I don't care, I just, I don't even wanna get out of bed sometimes. And so I figured if I just wasn't part of the equation, everybody's life would be much better without me. And so I was in the shower and as soon as I was getting out of the shower, don't ask me why I decided to take a shower before committing suicide. Like, I, I just don't even know what the, where the, where that came in. But while I was in the shower, I had, I was planning out like my husband takes a lot of medications for his migraines and all sorts of kind of things. It was there. And so I was going to overdose. Well, my husband walks in as I'm, I'm thinking about this and he sees me crying in the shower and he goes, what, what is wrong with you, Megan? Like, why, why do you keep doing this to yourself? And I said to him, I was like, I just think life would be better off without me. Like the kids, you like explained everything I was thinking inside my head and his face just kind of broke. Like, I, I feel like at that point in time, I just kind of broke him and his face just got so sad. And he was like, we need you and I need you to get help. And he was like, if you will just go get help, if you still want to do this after seeing a therapist, then I won't stand in your way. He's like, but I'm not letting you do this. Like this is not happening. So he did the best thing he could for me and he got me in to see a therapist. It changed my life. It was life changing. Like that first, I, I'm now my second therapist. We're military. Terry, so our therapists kind of move around sometimes too. My first therapist was military, so she moved. She helped me see that what was going on with me wasn't abnormal. It's not something for me to be ashamed of. And actually, it's something I've dealt with my entire life. So there's probably some kind of chemical imbalance or something going on there. And she's like, all of the trauma you've been through since a young child of, you know, verbal abuse with my parents, sexual abuse um, by my uncle, and so on and so forth, even like coming up to the accumulation of my ex being verbally sexually abusive with me, all this trauma that I never got to process in a healthy way. And instead I developed all these very unhealthy coping mechanisms. My psych professor says they're not coping mechanisms, they're defense mechanisms. What I think they're unhealthy coping mechanisms, <laughs> we'll go with that. That I built all these up to where I wasn't actually dealing with any of my feelings. I just kept suppressing them and not dealing with them and pushing them away and pretending like they didn't exist. And once I had a safe space to actually work through all those things, and I'm still working through it, almost five years later, I'm still working through and processing because there's been a lot that's happened. And when I ended with my first therapist. I was like, everything's great. I feel good. Everything's good. But I didn't realize there were still some very like underlying problems that I needed to work through. But going through therapy that first time I realized, oh, I can recognize what is going on here. And when I'm starting to depend on those defense mechanisms, as my psych professor calls them. And then I started seeing my my therapist now, we're even digging deeper into those things and bringing them up. And sometimes they're painful. And I've asked her multiple times, can't I go back to being blissfully unaware about what's wrong with me? Because that would be fantastic. And she says, no, that's not possible. You're at a point now, like this is not, there's no turning back. And seeing those therapists and having that life, life change, 
is actually what um, inspired me to go back to college to become a therapist myself. So right now I'm pursuing a degree in psychology. I haven't decided whether it's going to be a master's or PhD. We'll get there when we get there. Um, Because earlier on in my 20s, I actually developed anxiety as well. Like when I when future focused, like if I think too far in the future, <laughs> I get a lot of anxiety. So I'm like, you know what, when I get closer to making that decision, I'll make it. I'm trying not to make it right now. Um, and I actually became a women's empowerment coach because I was in the fitness industry also. And why I was there, I would see all my clients having all these like underlying problems and why they couldn't achieve their fitness goals, like why they couldn't you know, stick with something. And it wasn't because they weren't motivated or they didn't have the tools or they didn't have the accountability. It's because they have all these outside problems that are messing with their inside. So I wanted to be help them with those. And so the reason I went from women's empowerment coach where right now I help my clients with and discovering simple steps that can help minimize the chaos in their lives. That's pretty much what it is. To now I'm pursuing a degree in psychology because I would see those clients in my women's empowerment coaching that had even more underlying problems that I'm like, I'm not even capable of helping you with those. And I knew they revolved around mental health because majority of people out there have some sort of mental health problems. And they may be small. It may not even be like your, like me clinically depressed. It may be just things that you hadn't processed through, you know, and that are, are somewhere in the back of your head causing all this chaos going on. So that's why I decided I wanted to be a therapist now. And I, actually the goal is someday to be kind of like a mixture of the two to where like I could coach people, but then there's also people that I'm helping with just mental health. There's big dreams going on in this head right here. And I can't say that I am I'm done, I'm, that I'm cured of my depression or anxiety, that I don't, there's no cure for me. But I have discovered really amazing ways of helping me be the best version of myself and not have to consistently deal with symptoms of mental illness. Like I have a really great self-care routine. I'm very mindful of boundaries of the people I spend time with. You know, all of those things that lead up to me not having this consistent depression. And I'll admit there's sometimes that I just feel it coming on and I have tools that help me feel better. And there are times that I, I mean, in the last year, I think I've been depressed twice, which is great because it used to be every month. So it's like progress here. Um, and maybe someday I'll say I haven't been depressed in like five years. So that's a goal. But I, celebrate these little wins that, you know, it's been six months since the last time I was depressed. So that's really amazing. Wow. What a powerful story. I am so, you know, grateful that you've taken us on this journey because, you know, to see everything that you and hear everything that you've gone through, you know, from such a young age and through all of those hardships and those deep struggles that you've been through and the attempts that you had at taking your own life, which also ran in your family, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there could be some predisposition to that, but you know, the fact that you're here now and, you know, and I've seen this with, um, some of the other, um, episodes that we've had, um, on this channel is that a lot of people who are taking ownership of their mess and turning it into their message. And this has now become your actual path in life where you are, you're actually healing the former version of yourself. And we've talked about that before on this show because this is something so deeply rooted for you. And I'm so grateful that you've shared that part of your journey with us because to hear everything you've gone through, um, you know, that that's a lot. <laughs> that is a yeah. lot. And for some people, you know, I, there's that, there's that saying, you know, when, if everybody threw all their problems into a circle, you'd be running to grab yours back as you'd realize, oh, okay, maybe it's not so bad. And this is where it's so powerful to hear what other people have gone through and to see she made it through that. Like she made it through that. That is, and, and on top of that, being a military spouse, 
you know, if your husband's on deployment and you're home with four kids and you're dealing with this on your own and, you know, you're adding, you're adding that on top of everything. So, I mean, kudos to you, Megan. Yes. You know, I love that you um, not only are here to share this story, but now you're becoming part of the change and you do have big dreams and big visions and um, how you see mental health shifting, um, you know, in these coming years, which we totally partner on that vision. And I love that. Um, you know, so yeah, it's just, it's just so great to hear all the things that you've been doing. So thank you for sharing with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. So is there, is there anything that you want to really leave our viewers with, um, any last, you know, words of encouragement or, or nuggets or something you want to leave them with from you? Yeah. Mental health does not have to, or I should say mental illness does not have to define you. Like it's not a definition. You're not like, I'm, I'm depression. You're not depression. Depression is just something that you deal with on occasion, hopefully. And if you're not dealing with it on occasion right now, start working with the mental health professional, start working on your self-care to get to that point where it is on occasion, but it doesn't define you. Like I'm not depression. And even though like on my podcast, I share all the time about my mental health struggles and it has helped so many people that are like, you inspired me to go see a therapist or wow, I had this friend that was dealing with this and I kept making all these comments to her about just snapping out of it. And now I don't have to, I understand better to not say those things. Mm -hmm. And so I really want people to know that they're not defined by it those around them are not defined by it. It's really important that we come together and stop with the shame and stigma and judgment around mental health. It's just as normal to seek out a mental health professional for your you know, mental health struggles as it is to seek out a primary care physician for your physical health struggles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We totally agree on that. <laughs> so I want to, again, you know, Megan, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for... Um, you know, thank you for just sharing and opening up and allowing us into your world and, um, and for all the advice and little nuggets and the fact that, you, I mean, you're, you're in school for this now. So, Hey, you know, you <laughs> you stuff. So I'm going to pop up Megan's credits here at the end. And uh, anyone who wants to get in touch with Megan, um, you can follow her on her Instagram page. She's got a website. We'll have all of her, uh, her credits and social media handles so you can reach out and follow along Megan's journey. So thank you again uh, for joining us. It's been such an honor to share this space with you. And we are wishing you all the best <laughs> as you pursue your degree and go on to help change the stigma and um, and really fight for equality when it comes to the physical and mental health realm. So thank you for that. All right, everyone. Thank you guys again for watching this episode. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel so that you get notifications every time a new episode drops. Hope this has changed your world even one little bit or has helped somebody find hope in their healing. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you on the next episode.